Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again today. Um, I'll start with the usual update on the most recent COVID statistics. An additional 10 positive cases were confirmed yesterday, which takes the total now to 18,484. Uh, the Health Board breakdown of those cases will be available later as normal, uh, but the provisional information I have at the moment is that three of these 10 cases are in Lanarkshire, where we are dealing with an outbreak, which I'll say more about shortly. And at this stage, we know that one of these three is associated with that outbreak. From today, as well as reporting the overall number of positive cases, uh, which of course can fluctuate in line with the number of tests carried out. I'm also going to report the percentage of people tested who have been newly identified as positive. Uh, and for contact, context, the World Health Organization suggests that an indication of the epidemic being under control is that less than 5% of samples test positive over a two week period. So the 10 cases being reported today in Scotland represent 0.3% uh, testing positive. And just as a point of comparison, the 22 cases that we reported yesterday represented 0.8%. Now, I can also report that 295 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed COVID, which is eight fewer than yesterday. And you may remember from yesterday's briefing that we will now report figures for confirmed cases only. And a total of three people last night were in intensive care with confirmed COVID, which is one fewer than yesterday. I'm also very pleased to say that during the past 24 hours, uh, no deaths were registered of patients confirmed through a test as having the virus. And so the total number of deaths under this particular measure therefore remains at 2,491. In addition, though, the National Records of Scotland has just published its regular weekly report, which, as you uh, know by now, is more detailed than our daily figures. Like the daily figures, it includes deaths of people who've been confirmed through a test as having the virus, but it also covers cases where the virus has been entered on a death certificate as a suspected or a contributory cause of death, even if the presence of the virus hasn't been confirmed through a test. That's a wider measure, and therefore it captures more cases. The latest NRS report covers the period to Sunday the 19th of July. At that point, uh, just to remind you, according to our daily figures, 2,491 deaths of people who had tested positive had been registered. Today's report shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths with either a confirmed or a presumed link to the virus was 4,193. Of those, six were registered in the seven days up to Sunday, and that is a decrease of seven from the week before. Three of those six deaths were in care homes, which is a reduction of four from the previous week. Uh, the total number of deaths recorded last week from all causes, not just COVID, was 32 higher than the five-year average for the same time of year. Uh, we will, of course, be looking to see if there are any particular causes of concern uh, there, but it is worth remembering that the total number of deaths is always likely to fluctuate a bit. And last week's figures follow on from a three-week period when the total number of deaths was below the five-year average uh, by 18, 35 and 49, respectively. Last week was the 12th week in a row in which the number of deaths from COVID has fallen, in addition, the total weekly number of COVID deaths uh, now is the lowest we have seen since we started to record them in this way. So today's report shows once again that COVID has been driven, as of now, to very low levels in Scotland. However, the figures also remind us that more than 4,000 people have lost their lives to this virus. And we must always remember that each of those deaths was of a unique and irreplaceable individual. So I want to send my condolences again to everyone who is grieving the loss of a loved one. And always, uh, as always, uh, to send uh, my gratitude to our health and care workers for the extraordinary job that they continue to do. Now, I want to talk about uh, two issues uh, briefly uh, this afternoon. Um, in a few minutes, I'll go over some of the changes to lockdown rules, uh, which we have previously announced, but which come into effect today. However, before I do that, as I indicated uh, a few moments ago, I will give a brief update on the latest information we have about the COVID outbreak in Lanarkshire, based around the CTEL call centre. 
Since Saturday, since Sunday, an intensive contact tracing operation has been underway, and I want to convey my thanks to everyone involved in that. All staff at CTEL have been told to isolate at home for 14 days, and in addition, all staff have been asked to come forward for testing. As of this morning, around 390 test results out of around 400 uh, tested overall have been returned. And I can uh, confirm that as of uh, now, 15 positive cases have been identified of people who work at the site and a further five additional positive cases have been identified through the tracing of family members and close contacts. Contact tracing has also confirmed that a number of CTEL staff who have tested positive also had links to other locations prior to becoming aware of the outbreak. Environmental health officers have checked on all of those locations. They are satisfied that precautions such as protective equipment and cleaning were in place and that the risk of transmission is therefore low. Uh, close contacts from these locations have also been advised to isolate. And I want to take the opportunity today to thank these five locations, uh, which are Clark's Bar in Coat Bridge, the Railway Tavern and Merlin's Bar in Motherwell, Costa Coffee in Carfin and End Clothing in Glasgow for their cooperation. But I would also ask people who might have attended these locations over the last week or so to be extra vigilant, to follow all guidance and to isolate and book a test if you do experience any symptoms. And I'm saying this not because I think there is a real concern of transmission there, but simply as an added precaution. This outbreak, though, should be a very clear reminder to all of us that COVID hasn't gone away. It doesn't take much for very small numbers of cases to become much bigger numbers. And while Test and Protect and our local public health teams are working incredibly hard to contain outbreaks, it is not just their job. And I think that's an important point for all of us to remember. Each and every one of us has a part to play in keeping this virus at bay. The second point I want to briefly cover is just to confirm that in line with the timetable set out in a route map, more services are reopening today. Uh, from today, universities and colleges can institute a phased return to some on-campus learning. Further personal retail services such as beauticians and tailors can reopen with enhanced hygiene measures in place. Motorcycle instruction, tractor driving instruction and car theory tests can also resume from today. And finally, drive-in live events such as comedy and theatre shows, concerts and bingo evenings can also start to take place from today. Today's steps represent a further cautious reopening of sectors uh, of our economy and a, a cautious resumption of services. As always, there are some risks attached to this. There is nothing risk-free in any of this, but we believe that with the appropriate mitigations in place, these risks can be managed. As many of you will know, the regulations currently require us to review the lockdown restrictions every three weeks. The next review is due at next week, uh, next Thursday, which is a, a week tomorrow. And so I think probably now is the right time to inject a note of caution about what we might expect for the next few weeks. Uh, phase two of our emergence from lockdown, uh, you will recall, took exactly three weeks. But as I indicated two weeks ago, this current phase, phase three, is likely to last considerably longer than that. The changes we've made over the past two weeks have been really significant, including the opening up of our tourism sector and the opening up of indoor hospitality. So we have to carefully monitor the impact of all of that and the number of new cases that we're seeing each day. And as I've already said, examples like the outbreak in North Lanarkshire show what can happen when people are mixing indoors and when guidance is perhaps not being rigorously followed. At a time when the virus is picking up again in a number of European countries and these countries elsewhere in the world, we need to be confident that it is safe to change restrictions further. And our main focus right now, and I think it is a priority that will have widespread agreement across the country, our main focus right now is on keeping the virus at a low enough level to enable schools to fully and safely reopen from the 11th of August. That would be a further significant change. And in addition to that, we said already that if possible, we would like to remove the requirement for shielding from the 31st of July. And I'll say more about changes for shielding people tomorrow. 
So these two aims, allowing people who've been shielding to live more normally and enabling children to go back to school full time are really important priorities. And to be frank, they are only achievable if levels of COVID in the community remain very low. Now, obviously, we'll continue to review the data for new cases and hospital admissions, amongst other things. And our final decisions on this will not be taken until next week. If there are steps we can take, then we will. We cannot leave restrictions in place for longer than we judge to be necessary. But I did want to flag up now that it is possible that we may not be able to make any changes next week beyond confirming the return of schooling and a pause in shielding. And so for those businesses who are still waiting for a, a date to restart, I want to thank you for your ongoing patience. I fully understand how difficult any further delay is for you, but I also hope you will understand why we need to act safely and cautiously and prioritise the reopening of schools. I also want to underline that we are making changes at a pace and at a level that we think is right and safe for our current circumstances here in Scotland. Announcements made for other parts of the UK do not automatically apply here. For example, I want to underline that the UK government's encouragement to those who can work from home in England to nevertheless return to workplaces doesn't yet apply in Scotland. Working from home where that is feasible remains the default and preferred position and we expect employers to continue to support people to do that and we will be publishing new guidance on home working shortly. The cluster of cases I've just talked about uh, around the call centre in Lanarkshire is a salutary reminder that transmission of this virus can occur in workplaces and spread relatively easily when it takes hold. Our position remains, therefore, that non-essential offices and call centres should remain closed until we judge it is safe to make what will be a significant change for Scotland. Now, these notes of caution link to the point that I want to end on. It continues to be the case that the only way in which we can take further steps out of lockdown safely is if we continue to keep this virus at very low levels. And achieving that, now more than ever, comes down to the individual decisions that each and every one of us is making. I said yesterday, and it's worth repeating, that I know how difficult it is to maintain two metres distance when you're meeting people you haven't seen uh, for three or four months Especially with family members and close friends, the human instinct to hug and to be physically close is a very strong one. But staying that bit further apart can make all the difference. It makes you less likely to get the virus and it also makes you less likely to transmit it to others. The choices we all make as individuals on physical distancing, on wearing face coverings, on washing our hands, these will decide ultimately how quickly all of us can make further progress out of lockdown together. So I want to close once again by emphasising facts, the five key things that all of us must remember and abide by in everything we do. Face coverings uh, should be worn in enclosed spaces, shops and public transport, uh, the law says they must be worn, uh, but any enclosed space where physical distancing is more difficult, wear a face covering. Avoid crowded places, indoors or outdoors, clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly. Two metres distancing remains the rule and I think it is the one uh, measure that we all need to constantly remind ourselves to comply with. Uh, and lastly, self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. Go to NHS Inform uh, website and book a test immediately if you have a new cough, a fever, or if you experience a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. Don't hang around to wait to see if you feel better. Do it straight away. Uh, if we all stick to this, then we have a real chance of keeping this virus under control and accelerating our progress back to something that feels much more normal than life has felt over the past four months. So my thanks again to everybody who is cooperating and playing their part. I'll hand over now uh, briefly to the Chief Medical Officer and then we will, as always, go to questions. Thank you, First Minister. Today I also want to use this opportunity to reinforce some of the key messages about how we can all help to keep ourselves and others safe your hard work and commitment has helped us to keep our rate of new infections and deaths low. Thanks to you, we've been able to start opening society back up again, and we're now able to look forward to things like schools reopening in the near future. But I want to emphasise, just as the First Minister has, that COVID-19 has not gone away. As we introduce new changes, there's an increasing risk that people will begin to become less careful as they go about their lives. The recent outbreaks in Annan and in North Lanarkshire should remind us that this virus has not gone away and that we can't let our guard slip. As we start to get back out into the world, 
as we start to go back to pubs, to restaurants and coffee shops, there's always the possibility that we'll start to see outbreaks of infection. Now, the best way that we can stop those outbreaks from spreading is by making sure that we all remain vigilant. If you're out in a supermarket, for example, remember to wear a face covering and try to keep a two-metre distance from other people if you can. I recognise that it's difficult to remember, remember all of this, to remember all of the time, but when I've been out and about, I've noticed that some people are becoming less careful about physical distancing. And some are even wearing masks without covering their mouth and their nose. This is important and I ask you to try your utmost at all times. Please remember to wash your hands regularly for at least 20 seconds using soap and warm water or hand gel. If you do go out to a pub or a restaurant, make sure you leave your details. These will be safely stored and destroyed if they aren't needed, but they'll help our contact tracers to find you if you've been in contact with someone who's been diagnosed with coronavirus. And if you develop symptoms, a fever, a new and continuous cough, or any changes in your sense of taste or smell, please, please make sure you book a test. You can do this online at NHS Inform or by calling 0800 028 2816. We want to make sure that everyone is able to get out and enjoy going back to shops, cafes and bars safely. Your determination to date has made that possible. Sticking to these guidelines will help to ensure that we're able to carry on enjoying our hard-won freedoms and will help us and the NHS to keep our friends, our families and our neighbours safe. Thank you very much, Gregor. We'll move now straight to questions. Uh, Katie Hunter from BBC Scotland. Afternoon, First Minister. Um, we received information at around 10 o'clock on Saturday morning that there'd been a positive case um, at CITEL, but some staff who worked in different parts of the building had told us they continued um, to work there on Saturday afternoon. Um, now, the Deputy First Minister said this morning something had quite clearly gone wrong. I was just wondering if you can expand on that and if there are any concerns about possible delays in either closing the building or passing on information to the authorities? Well, we're obviously very focused right now uh, through our public health team uh, locally and, and Test and Protect in containing this outbreak and I, I don't want to be complacent. We you know, still have to see what unfolds over the next few days. Um, but at the moment, uh, given the, the number of test results we have back, uh, we have perhaps slightly greater confidence today than I might have expressed yesterday that we seem to be that test and protect seems to be working effectively. But obviously, as I say, we need to to see uh, what unfolds over the next few days. Um, as you've heard me and and Gregor and Jason Leach say here previously, when we have outbreaks like this, it is not certain, uh, but it raises the, the real prospect that guidelines have not been rigorously followed. And that's why we take so much time and effort to underline the importance of sticking to all, all of the guidance. Uh, we will, of course, look back uh, at all of these outbreaks, those working to try to contain this, to see whether uh, there uh, would have been opportunities to pick it up earlier or, or whether there are specific breaches of guidelines that we can identify. Uh, but at the moment, um, and I... I my, my podium here is not wood, so I can't uh, touch it effectively. But um, at the moment, I have growing confidence that our test and protect system is, is working effectively the way we would want it uh, to do. But we will continue to learn lessons from all of this uh, in order that we continue to get even more effective at controlling outbreaks like this. Because this virus hasn't gone away, it is going to be out there for some time to come. So we have to make sure that we are absolutely on top of any outbreaks that do occur. But, but my last point is one I will keep repeating. We've all got a part to play in this. If we all follow the facts, guidance, we don't eradicate completely uh, the prospect of transmission because this is a, an very infectious virus, but we do minimise it and we reduce that prospect. So it comes back to that obligation that rests on all of us. Uh, Sharon through STV. Uh, I was just, uh, you mentioned there that all non-essential call centres and offices will remain closed. It had been anticipated that uh, some could reopen from the 31st of this month. Um, are you now considering further measures to ensure that checks, uh, social distancing is, is being maintained within larger workplaces? And, and when can we expect non-essential call centres to reopen? Well, I, I can't give a date for that right now. I, I should say what I've done today is, is flag up the possibility that when we come to the next review next week, we will not announce any significant changes other than I hope uh, confirm the return to full-time schooling. And uh, I also hope that we can confirm the pause 
in shielding. Um, and obviously that has an implication for the further period that we will be advising people who can work from home to work from home and to say to non-essential offices and call centres not to open. How uh, much longer that is likely to last, I cannot say with certainty right now because we've got to judge that. Uh, let me just say that while the Lanarkshire call centre outbreak is a, a salutary reminder to us of how easily the virus can spread in settings like that, that is not the, the sole reason for what I'm saying today. Uh, the chances are I would have said what I said today even if this outbreak hadn't happened. The, the main reason for it um, is that we have decided, and I think we have decided for right, the right reasons, that our priority over the weeks ahead is to get children back to school because we know the harm that has been done to children uh, by being out of school for such a, a lengthy period of time. So we, have, we are making a choice that that is our priority, coupled, of course, with the, the shielding uh, pause that I hope we can confirm. And if that is our priority, we've got to be prepared to focus on delivering that. And it will only be delivered if prevalence of the virus remains very low. So given the, the scale of the changes we've made in the last couple of weeks, it seems to me very likely that we will decide to just take a bit longer to make sure that those changes are not uh, having an adverse effect on spread of the virus before we add anything else into that. Because if we start adding more in at this stage, we, we raise the, the likelihood of our priority of getting schools back being compromised. And I don't want to do that. So that's the we've been cautious all along in this journey so far. But if there's going to be even more caution over the next uh, few weeks it is for that primary purpose of doing everything we can to secure the full-time return to schooling of children come August. Uh, Callum Clark from Bower. Good afternoon, First Minister. The Republic of Ireland has today released its green list of countries for safe travel. Scotland isn't on that list alongside England and Wales. And Ireland says it's only allowing countries with the, the same or, or a lower R number. Um, can I just ask your thoughts on the exclusion? And just a second question, do we have an updated R number in Scotland and has it at all increased? Um, I'll come back to the R number in a, in a second. I, I, I'm not going to speak for Ireland. Uh, I absolutely respect the right of any country to take the decisions they think are right uh, for themselves. So while, of course, I... I look forward to the day when uh, people in Scotland can travel uh, to, to Ireland uh, without any uh, need for quarantine. If Ireland judges right now that because of the position UK wide, um, that that is not the time for that is not now, I will not second guess or, or complain about that decision. They're taking the decisions that they think are right for uh, their population and they are entitled, not just entitled to do that, I think they are their right to do that. Um, on the, the R number, there's a, we report our R number um, every Thursday, so we'll report the, the latest R number tomorrow. It has been below one without really much change now for the past number of weeks. But what you might have heard me say before, and you are certainly going to hear me say more often in the future, that as prevalence becomes very low, the R number becomes less of a reliable indicator because very, very small changes can lead to quite big changes in it. And it's not necessarily, rep it's an average measure, so it's not necessarily representative of what's happening. The decisions we're taking around air bridges and international travel are based on uh, assessments of prevalence data. Um, and, you know, we, a couple of weeks ago, decided not to uh, exempt Spain from uh, quarantine uh, requirements uh, because at that point, the prevalence data we had for Spain showed that it was significantly higher than ours. The most up-to-date prevalence data uh, for Spain, which is why we took the, the decision to include Spain on the exempt list earlier this week, shows that the, the prevalence estimate is now very close to ours. That said, and I want to stress this point, not just in relation to Spain, but generally, these situations are not cast in stone. Uh, there is a lot of volatility around this virus uh, across the world right now. We see uh, a number of outbreaks in Spain, uh, but also in, in other countries. So we are keeping all of this under review literally on a daily basis right now. And all of these decisions are subject to change and could be subject to change at very short notice. And I, I suppose the reason I'm saying this is to give a very clear indication to people watching that if you're booking a foreign holiday right now or foreign travel for any reason, you cannot do that on the basis of certainty. That because the country you might be travelling to is exempt from quarantine when you leave to go there, that it will still be exempt from quarantine when you come back. Nor can you have certainty that the, 
the rules and regulations within the country you are going to will not change while you're there. I would love to give you that certainty, but I can't because this virus is volatile and unpredictable. Um, so my advice to anybody thinking of travelling overseas is to think very carefully about that. And perhaps if your trip is not essential, then perhaps not uh, to, to commit to it right now. And if it is about holidays, if you want to take a holiday over the remainder of the summer, perhaps think about doing that in Scotland rather than going overseas. And I, I, I take no, I have no relish in saying this. I would love nothing more than to say I can give you certainty right now that the situation in Spain or, or any of the other countries that, that we might be looking at will not change. But I can't do that because of the, the unpredictability of the situation we're dealing with. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. Thanks, First Minister. Just going back to the uh, Cytel outbreak. Are you considering any sort of lo uh, local lockdown in Lanarkshire to prevent any more spread of the virus there? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, we're not. We had a, a resilience Scottish Government resilience meeting uh, late yesterday afternoon. Uh, our indications at this stage, and I think this is reflected in the numbers that we have, have been able to share, is that the, the, the health protection approach and test and protect is working to, to contain uh, this outbreak at the moment. Um, and you know there has been an extensive contact tracing operation. The other locations that I've mentioned today have all you know been visited and looked at, and and the precautions they're taking uh, assessed as well. Now, should that change, and, and our assessment of that change, then obviously we will consider if other action is necessary. But at this stage, the work that has been done locally to keep this uh, under control, uh, we think is is being effective, and and therefore at this stage we're not considering a, a local lockdown or imposing any uh, other restrictions on Lanarkshire that we wouldn't be imposing in other parts of the country. The other point to make um, about uh, the nature of this call centre is that the, the people who work in it don't all live in Lanarkshire. Many of them will have travelled to work from other areas. So it's not quite as simple, even if we thought it was necessary, at just having a local lockdown. But at the moment, we don't think that is, is necessary. Do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, clearly it's something that we continue to keep a close eye on. The incident management team continues to meet on a daily basis just now just to discuss uh, the actions necessary to make sure that this incident remains under control. And I've been liaising very closely with Incident Commander Dr David Cromie in, in all of this, not only looking at the incident itself, but actually looking at the wider Lanarkshire picture as well, so that we can assure ourselves that there are no signs over the last uh, weeks uh, of any kind of um, emerging infections, clusters elsewhere in Lanarkshire, rising numbers uh, that, that we might want to become aware of and, and, and take further action for. Uh, I'm confident that the incident management team have a, a good grip of the situation just now and we'll obviously continue to keep in touch with them and, and make sure that it, um, uh, we're, we're abreast of any changes. Okay, uh, Tom Eden from uh, Global. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to the CMO, first off, you're, you sit on SAGE, um, the UK's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Valance, last week, uh, gave evidence that SAGE was recommending full lockdown in mid-March, a week before it was actually introduced here. Um, can I ask, was that advice passed on to the Scottish Government by you or your predecessor, um, and what was done with that advice? And then to the First Minister, um, with reports that the Prime Minister is due to visit Scotland tomorrow, do you have any plans to meet him? And if not, what's your message to him and what do you feel the most pressing issue is you want him to consider while he's here? Um, do you want to yeah, I'm very happy to answer the question. First of all, so 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 yes, um, I, I've been uh, a participant in, in many of the Sage meetings over the, um, the 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 last few months, and um, at that period of time, um, the information which was being discussed at Sage, very uh, a big focus of that was was actually about the timing and the extent of any measures which should be undertaken in, in, in order to try to restrict the transmission of the virus, and those discussions. Uh, took place both between my, uh, my myself and the CMO and with other members of government as, uh, as well. And the important consideration there was about to follow the recommendations of SAGE about the actual timing of, of, of any measures, the implementation of any measures. You'll recall that at that point in time, um, there was a lot of discussion about the sequence of any measures and how they should be introduced and, and, and that in, in Scotland in particular at that point in time is, is that we made a decision um, to, 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 to uh, go forward with some of those uh, measures at a slightly earlier stage. Um, 
And on, can I just, before I answer uh, the uh, question Tom asked of me, I think I gave uh, an inaccurate name for the bar in Coke Bridge associated with the Lanarkshire outbreak earlier. I think I might have said Clark's Bar, just to clarify, it is Owen's uh, Bar, so my apologies if I if I made an error there. Um, I have no plans to meet the Prime Minister tomorrow. Um, I'm always happy to meet the Prime Minister if he uh, wants to do so. Um, I'm always happy to uh, welcome people in Scotland. I would ask anybody coming to Scotland, uh, the Prime Minister included, to make sure they follow all of the facts advice uh, while they are here, and I'm sure he'll be doing that uh, anyway. Um, look, we're all very uh, focused on uh, the immediate priority of uh, continuing to suppress COVID and uh, I look forward to working with the UK government on that uh, basis and we've, we've got our political disagreements, we've got disagreements um, over aspects of, of Scotland and the UK's future and I'm sure we'll continue to uh, discuss those constructively as, as well. Um, the next question is from Tom Martin at the Daily Express. Hi, thank you First Minister. Um, Perhaps one for maybe the CMO first to address, just on the Lanark outbreak. Um, how close do you think we are to our authorities are to sort of closing closing it down the down down this cluster and transmission? And secondly, just for the for yourself, First Minister, just following up on your earlier remarks regarding phase three, should the public now sort of be just getting be prepared that this that this stage of exiting lockdown is going to be the new normal for the foreseeable future? So, so the management of the incident in North Lanarkshire is ongoing just now, and uh, I'm not going to start to speculate about when we would um, close that incident. Uh, meetings continue on a daily basis just now. Um, I think my own perspective would be that this is still fairly early uh, in the incident, but there are some encouraging signs, particularly given the volume of testing that's already been undertaken for staff and um, the, the, the fact that there are relatively few um, uh, positive results um, in, in today's uh, figures that we've, we've given you. So um, whilst, as I say, I'm not going to be drawn into speculation about when it will be closed, I'm very conscious of the fact that this virus has an incubation period that could be anything from, you know, five to 14 days, and we must continue to track uh, uh, to see any emerging symptoms or positive cases in the workforce over that whole time before we kind of jump to any conclusions about whether the, the outbreak is indeed controlled. Um, and on the question to me, I, I, I don't think there's much more um, I can or, or particularly want to say about the timing of a move from phase three to phase four, other than um, I think phase three will last longer than the three weeks that previous phases, phases have, have lasted. And that, as I said earlier, is because we both want to assess the impact of the phase three changes because they are big changes. Um, as we know, a lot more indoor activity and it takes time for any impact of that to, to work its way out and for us to be aware of that. But also because we are so determined, if at all possible, to get schools back, that there is an argument right now for, uh, if you like, pausing uh, with the changes we've made before we make any, any more. Uh, but that is not to say there will not be more changes uh, in the... Uh, the, the weeks and months to come. Um, but there are some things, and this is where I suppose saying to people to get used to some of the things we're all having to do right now makes sense because there are some aspects of what we're all being asked to do uh, and it is encapsulated in the facts guidance that we are likely to be asking people to do for quite some considerable time to come. And, and that is about face coverings. I said when we made them mandatory in shops that people should prepare for that to be the case for the foreseeable future. Nothing has changed in my mind about that, the, the advice to wash your hands thoroughly, to maintain some physical distance, to self-isolate, book a test, avoid crowded places. I don't see any of that advice changing in the imminent future because this virus hasn't gone away. And this week we've had um, some positive news on vaccine development. And, and I think all of us felt you know, quite optimistic when we heard that news this week, but nothing is, is guaranteed. And we therefore have to assume that some of the precautions that we're living with right now will be with us for a long time. So on these basic hygiene measures, it's not just because they're important in the here and now that I would say to people, keep reminding yourself of them. It is because we're all going to have to get used to that. And so better to get into the habit of doing these things now uh, so that it becomes much more second nature than perhaps it, it has been so far. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, when you kept Spain off the quarantine, uh, well, the average list a couple of weeks ago, you cited a, an infection prevalence rate of 330 per 100,000 compared to 28 in Scotland. 
Now, you mentioned earlier that that gap has closed substantially. I just wondered if you could provide the specific updated figures if possible. And secondly, there's been reports this morning of the UK government perhaps looking at a sort of regional average team for countries like Portugal, i.e. sort of air bridges to those areas with relatively low infection rates, but perhaps not to Lisbon. Is that, some, is that an approach you might be uh, willing to consider? So, uh, well, I'll take your, your questions in the order you asked them. So when we announced a couple of weeks ago that we were not lifting quarantine uh, for Spain, the prevalence figures I quoted then, you're, you're absolutely right about them, were at 0.028 for Scotland, which is the 28 per 100,000, and 0.33 for Spain, uh, which was the 330 per 100,000. So, you know, about 10 times higher, more than 10 times higher in Spain than in Scotland. The most recent prevalence data, and we get this data through the, the Joint Biosecurity Centre arrangements, uh, the most recent prevalence data we have for Spain, uh, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a second, is 0 0.015, uh, which is much more in line with what we assess Scotland's to be right now. I think the caveats I have to inject around this, though, would be firstly, there is always a bit of a lag in this data. So it's not bang up to date. And you'll recall that that was one of the concerns I had previously. And secondly, we know the situation in, in at least parts of Spain is quite volatile just now. And we're seeing parts of Spain with rising prevalence. So it is possible that that prevalent rate in Spain is increasing again and that is why we have to keep this under review and I cannot say for Spain or for any other country just as other countries cannot say with certainty for Scotland or other parts of the UK that this will ch will never change just because we've made a decision this week if the the next data we get on this suggests a, a greater cause for concern, we may have to review that. And, and that really underlines the general point I was making. You cannot book a holiday right now with certainty that none of this changes. I, I wish you could. I, I wish I could give you that certainty, but I can't. So it's, it's only fair for me, in light of that, to say to you, you have to be aware that if you book a holiday, I, I don't want to keep singling out Spain, but it's a country we're talking about. If you book a holiday to Spain because you think that in two weeks' time or three weeks' time, the quarantine arrangements might not apply. There's no guarantee of that. Um, and there's no guarantee that the, the country you go to, if they have an outbreak, won't impose some further measures while you're there. And that all leads me to the very reluctant conclusion that says you should think very carefully right now about overseas travel if it's not essential. Um, and if you want to holiday, holiday here in Scotland. And that has the added advantage, of course, of helping our own tourist industry, which really needs that support and help at this time. Um, on the point about regional air bridges, you know, we, we keep everything under review. You know, we, we want to open up the country as, as much as possible, as quickly as possible, but as safely as possible. So we, we don't rule anything like that out, but nor am I yet in a position to say that that is something that we think is, is likely to be done imminently. I think you were trying to ask me a follow-up or... I... No, it was okay. It was just, I just, think, just wanted to press you on the regional air bridges. Sorry, that was, that's all. Okay. Yeah. You should have known I was much. coming on to it anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, impatience. Sorry about that. Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, um, First Minister. Uh, on the position you've set out today about the prospect of a, a longer spell in Phase 3, it will come as bad news to some business owners, for example, gyms, swimming pools, live venues. Would it be your intention next week when you, when, uh, the next review to, to set out a timeline or timescale uh, for businesses in that position? Um, I don't know yet is the, the not great answer. I know for businesses that are, are anxious to hear that, but it's, it's the, the frank answer because we haven't yet got to the point of, of making the formal assessment that then will lead to what I set out next week. What I will say is where, where we can give certainty, and I think you know this from past weeks and... and you know, the, the tendency we have had to, to announce dates in the future, even if there were some weeks in the future, where we can do that, we will do that, because I absolutely understand the importance to businesses in sectors that are not uh, reopened yet. But if we don't yet, if we don't think it is possible to do that, I'd rather be frank than give false expectations. So, you know, we are, th these regulations that are in place um, 
put an, an onus on the Scottish Government legally that we can't keep restrictions in place uh, for no reason. We, we have to be satisfied that any restrictions are still necessary for the public health imperative. So the assessments we do are serious. We've got to consider all of the, the evidence and all of the, the different factors and then come to balanced views. And, and that's what we will seek to do. And, and I'll be able to set out more detail of that next Thursday, which I, I will do again in, in Parliament. But I think given my... My view at the moment, and given the primacy of that getting schools open again uh, objective, I think it's only fair at this stage to give a bit of an indication that we might not be seeing further significant change next week other than the reopening of schools in August and, I hope, the pause in shielding advice. Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Good afternoon. Um, your comments today seem to indicate that it could be at least four weeks until non-essential offices are advised that they, they can open. Um, do you have any concerns about the impact that that could have on Scotland's town centres, especially since a lot of retail and hospitality companies are largely relying on the, the trade of uh, office workers, do you, do you worry that there could be this could actually force some of them to to close for good? Uh, Michael, there's there's not a single aspect of COVID or what we're having to do to deal with COVID that doesn't worry me. That you know, I, I worry about all of this. None of this is is ideal. That's a possibly the understatement of the century, and, and none of this is done lightly. So yes, I worry about the impact of uh, any business that continues to be affected by lockdown restrictions. Of course I do. Um, and it's because I worry about that that I am you know, keen to get these restrictions lifted as quickly as possible. But I also worry about the impact of letting the virus run out of control again, because not only do I know and do all of us know from bitter experience over the past four months that that will lead to more people dying, but it will also, and you know, everything we learn about what this virus does to people says that you don't want to take risks in getting it, because even if you if it doesn't take your life, it can have horrible health consequences for you that perhaps last longer than the virus itself does. So I worry about those impacts as well. And I know that if those impacts are, uh, are realised, then that also has a much worse impact on the economy, medium to long term. So none of this is straightforward. None of these decisions, you know, we agonise. I personally agonise over every single one of these decisions. And, and you should want me to do that because they are some of the most serious decisions anybody in my position has had to take in our lifetimes. So none of it is taken lightly. And all of these different factors are weighed up and we try to come to a balanced decision that is in the overall interest of the country, protecting health, but protecting our economy and, and giving the economy the most sustainable foundation for a longer term recovery. Chris Musson from The Sun. Uh, hi, Mr. Um, you just read out a list of locations linked to people infected in the Cytel outbreak, so people can be on the lookout for symptoms, I think you said. Um, shouldn't you have done that similar for the Nike outbreak in February? It's just that that information you put out today makes the early secrecy around the Nike cluster sound all the more strange, surely. Um, well, possibly for the one millionth and tenth uh, time I will I will cover at Nike. We 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 make judgments on a case by case basis, and as I've said before, that the public health team, the incident management team that dealt with Nike, had at any point they thought uh, the the identity of that event uh, should have been made public. They would have made that public, um, and you know these are judgments I, I've said before that as we get into this phase of the virus with test and protect operational different judgments may be applied. The balance between uh, patient confidentiality and wider public awareness may be different. And, and there will be other instances in the future where we may decide it's not necessary to name particular locations. So these are, are judgments that we make um, on a case-by-case -case basis with that overall objective of uh, keeping this virus suppressed and containing outbreaks where uh, they, they happen. Of course, what we now know uh, from Nike, uh, because of the genomic sequencing that's been done, is that that event did not lead to uh, a wider outbreak. And in actual fact, what that tells us is that the public health management of that uh, was successful. Um, so that's uh, the, the reason. I don't know whether you want to add anything about uh, the genomic sequencing or... Anything. So, so I think it's really important that we remember that the incident management teams judge each incident on, on, on their own basis. 
uh, and that we are at a very different stage now. We have um, the test and protect system in place, where, which means that we can chase down um, any contacts and, and, and make sure that we're following any potential chains of transmission in a way that allows us to, to really try to achieve to, to, to not only control any outbreak, but, but really stamp down on it as, as quickly and as hard as, as possible at this stage. Um, the, the, the announcements we've made today are, are really just to kind of support that effort, but, but also I think it's right that we, we just inform the public in this instance um, that um, they should remain vigilant. You heard me say um, in, in the statement that I made today that, that we must all continue to remain vigilant at all times, both for the, the symptoms that would alert us to the need for testing, but, but also just to make sure that um, when we're out and about is that we're taking all the, the, the kind of precautions that we would expect people to take, using face coverings, making sure that we're avoiding crowded places, making sure that we're keeping distance uh, of two metres from each other, just to make sure that we reduce the opportunities for this virus to be able to spread again. David Gall from The Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, you said earlier that your priority was to see schools being able to reopen full time. Uh, looking at the situation in Lanarkshire, if that were to escalate or we had any other outbreaks um, over the next few weeks, would it be possible that the decision to reopen schools could be taken on a, a local basis if certain areas are um, having more success in suppressing the virus? And just quickly on the test and protect scheme, um, do we know how long patients are having to wait to get the results after being tested? Um, on the uh, latter point, the, the turnaround time for testing is, is, is reasonably quick. I think, although I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, uh, the, most tests, uh, the, the turnaround time is, is within the 24-hour period, but we're still working to improve that. And uh, we, I think, over the next period, want to uh, develop uh, more data that we will routinely publish about the performance of test and protect. And I, I think that the turnaround time for tests will be one of the, the metrics that we look to, to add uh, to that. On the point about uh, schools, we, we want to get schools in every part of the country open full time, and that is, is the objective. Um, obviously, that depends on prevalence of the virus and community transmission of the virus being at low levels. I think we've got to be very clear um, that we are going to see outbreaks because the virus hasn't gone away. And just because there's an outbreak, as we've seen in Lanarkshire, hopefully, uh, doesn't mean that that leads to widespread community transmission. It, it could, and that is the risk. But if all of the systems, test and protect in particular, work effectively, then the, the, the objective is to keep those outbreaks under control and to stop them running into wider community transmission. And that really is, is what we are, we are looking at. Is there, is, is there community transmission of the virus that is increasing across the country in, or in particular areas? But the way to, to, to avoid this is for all of us to follow the rules, to minimise the risk of spread. And when we have outbreaks, for us to make sure that the test and protect and the local health protection systems are working effectively. That was the case in Dumfries and Galloway a few weeks ago where that uh, outbreak was successfully contained. I think it's too early for us to say that definitively in Lanarkshire, but I know the work that has been done there and the efforts that are being put into making sure that as far as possible, we keep that one under control as well. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just to kind of follow up really on David's question, um, I know you said you're not considering uh, a local lockdown for Lanarkshire at the moment, um, partly because it's not suitable to people travelling in and out and things like that. C can you tell us um, what are the kind of upper limits or what kind of factors would there need to be before you would consider making a different decision in terms of schools or for a local lockdown, um, even kind of potential in a, in a different outbreak in the future? There's... A, a Life would be a lot easier, I think, if there was just one simple um, measure that you could apply to these things. That, that's not the case here. We look at a range of different things. Uh, we look at you know, new cases, we look at hospital admissions, uh, ICU admissions, deaths. We, we're, looking, we're increasingly trying to look at uh, upstream data that give us as early an indication of anything that should be concerning as possible. So we're looking right now um, at, for example, calls to NHS 24. So are we seeing in any part of the country an increase in calls with respiratory problems that might tell us that there's a, a bit of a problem emerging there? So it's not a single, a single number or a single metric. And also we have to look at um, 
whether outbreaks are being effectively controlled. We are going to see outbreaks. Obviously, we want to try to minimise the number, but we are going to see outbreaks. And so the, the question then is, are they being controlled? It's when they're not being controlled and they are seeping into community transmission that issues of wider measures, whether that's lockdowns or closing places that would otherwise be open, come into uh, to play. Uh, we're not there at that stage in Lanarkshire right now, and hopefully we will manage to avoid that. Uh, but these are the, the sort of complex judgments that we have to make in different circumstances. Do you want to you know, one of the reasons we have these incident management teams is so that we can consider the whole range of data and intelligence that's available to these teams as they're assessing an incident and what measures are required to, to, to make sure that it remains controlled. And the incident management team is also complemented then by the, the, the SCORE meetings that we've had within Scottish Government as well, where we link back to our partners as well, just to make sure that um, all of us are aware of exactly the, the range of, as I say, intelligence and information that's available. In that. And that's where the, the, the judgments are applied. And, and there's, there is no one measurement, there is no one specific piece of information that determines that. But the important thing is to look to see whether there is any evidence of community transmission which is uncontrolled, which is uncontained, and, and that might require further measures to be taken in relation to that. And as I say, at this point in time with the large outbreak, it's very, very fortunate to say um, that, that there's no evidence of that. And last question today is Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thank you very much, First Minister. Um, an all-party House of Commons rapid inquiry into COVID-19 to prepare for a potential second wave held, held its first meeting this morning. Dr Philippa Whitford and SNP MPs, its vice chair. I just wondered, if approached, will you give evidence to this inquiry and or would you allow your officials to do so? Uh, we always try to cooperate with, with inquiries, whether well, obviously with uh, any committee uh, of the Scottish Parliament that does work like this, but also with, with Westminster committees. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Gregor, I think you have appeared before Westminster committees um, already in the course of, of this pandemic. So the short answer is yes. Obviously, who would go would depend on the nature of the request, whether that would be me personally or a, you know, a, another minister or the chief medical officer or other officials. But absolutely, we would uh, want to cooperate fully. That concludes our questions uh, today. Uh, can I thank the journalists, as always, uh, thank Gregor for joining me today, and Yvonne, our BSL interpreter, and thank you for joining us. Um, we'll be back tomorrow, Thursday, I think tomorrow is, at 12.15, the, the earlier time, which I, I'll remind you is now the standard time for uh, these briefings. In the meantime, please continue to follow the fact, advice, face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean your hands and hard surfaces, two metres distancing, and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. We are, as we see from the figures today, notwithstanding the, the outbreak in Lanarkshire, which many people are currently working hard to contain, notwithstanding that, we are seeing the prevalence of the virus continue to be at very low levels, and thankfully we're, we're seeing the associated statistics around hospital admissions and, and deaths go in the right direction. But keeping that progress going in that right direction depends on all of us. Um, it depends on each and every one of us doing all the right things. So please continue to do that um, and so that we can continue to make this progress. But thank you for joining us today and uh, we will see you again tomorrow.